So because I was an auditor, I said I will go and audit people and help them get better. Um, so as an auditor, I did not know much about what was happening in the rest of the organization. And also, I was, I was in pain. You know when you are in pain, you're not looking outside too much. You are just living your life and just taking care of yourself now and your immediate people. And that was my, that was my condition at the time. I had also started to get suicidal thoughts because there was no other way I could stop the pain in my head. Um, we were not allowed to take aspirin, we were not allowed to take painkillers, even though I did, but they didn't work. Um, and so I, I was not much interested in what was going on outside. I'm sorry to say. Do you know who was in charge of this operation? Of the nursery? Yeah. No, but I could go back, not, not sitting here now, no, not at this point. Okay. But I could go back, I could contact Judy and find out, I could contact other people okay. to find out who was in charge of that because um, area. Because that would really be interesting, I think, since in Clearwater there are also a lot of anonymous who could investigate. Who could look into it. Yeah. Good, I will do that. I will contact Judy and see and see where we can go yeah. with that. And there were other children, back to the nursery, there were other children from anywhere from three to nine years old, 10 years old, who as punishment, and, I, and again, I don't know punishment for what, were made to pick lint off the carpet. You know, the little bits of papers and things that stick on the carpet. For hours each day, while they said, I'm glad to be in the sea organization, I'm glad to be in the sea organization, I'm glad to be in the sea organization. And Judy has seen that many times, she has said. And then there was the Rock Slam project in the late 1970s. It was really Hubbard's witch hunt, his purge, uh, to find those disloyal to him, because in those days he was getting more and more fearful and he feared that even those people close to him were disloyal and hundreds of people were assigned to the RPF which and the RPF's RPF. Which might not be taken away from too far because David Miscavige, as we all know, yeah. he had probably, yeah. I think he was already very early in 1980s, 81, 82, came to realize that he might assume power that he started to make his plans then already. That seems, that seems very likely to me, because he was there in and around seeing what was going on all that time. Yes, and he was seeing Hubbard from time to time. Yes. And he would see his condition. Yes, that is correct. And by soon after this happened, the RS project happened, uh, either just before or just after, Hubbard had left Clearwater and was already in hiding in other places. Um, in 1978, <coughs> I'm going back just a little, came my own inevitable RPF assignment um, for one year, and all I remember is the intense Florida heat, my head pounding, the pain, running up and down, endless flights of stairs to clean toilets, we were not allowed to walk anywhere. I had to work with one young lady from the Guardian's office who was assigned to the RPF. Her name was Lynn Froyland. She had done something terribly bad. Guardian's office people were not normally assigned to the RPF, but she was, so I knew she had done something terribly bad. And she refused to confess. I had to audit her. She refused to do anything. She refused to confess. She refused to tell me what she had done. And she was assigned to the RPF's RPF, which was in the basement of the Fort Harrison Hotel, in the boiler room, where the heat was intense. They had a boiler that was about two, three stories high that was boiling all the time for hot water. It was dark, it was filthy, and she was chained to one of the pipes. You could only, you could only move through that boiler room 
almost crouched down, and so she was in one corner chained to one of the pipes. Filthy, dirty, and still insolent, Lynn would not talk. She would not com she would she would not cooperate. And years later, in some lawsuit, with Jerry and I were called to um, give testimony. Um, I happened to mention this account of Lynn, and in response, she was still in Scientology afterwards. She made her response and she said her experience really wasn't that bad. She went, but she admitted to, to, to it. She, she admitted, admitted to it, but she said it wasn't that bad. And um, anyway, um, after I graduated the RPF, and I'm going to come back to the word graduate. In Scientology, every, every word for a bad experience is turned into a good word. So you graduate to RPF. After I graduated, I was told in a board of review that I was exonerated. I should never have been assigned to the RPF. My rank was restored. My back pay was restored. And I was glad to get the pardon, but my will was really broken. Um, Nothing worked, nothing that they were able to do to me helped me. And then I began getting panic attacks as well. Um, I began getting strange things happening where at one point I knew I had to leave, at another point I didn't remember that at all. All I knew was I had to stay in Scientology and confess and try to be a good person. And it was very bad. And I finally left at that time. Um, it took about <coughs> three, four months. Um, I was threatened during that time. I was told to go back to the RPF. I was ordered back. I refused. I said, no, there's no way I will ever go back into that RPF. I will stay in my room. I will not talk to anyone, but there's no way you will get me to clean in the kitchen, to clean in the grounds, to go to the RPF. My very, very, very good friend, Doreen Kaplan Casey, offered to help put all my hours for all my auditing together, which is a requirement. My bill came to something like $350,000, $400,000 that I had freeloaded debt that I had to pay back. I started to pay it back, but after a few years I said to hell with it, no, no way, no way. 